Evan, I wanted to call your attention to just these few words in this second verse we just sang, deeds and words and death and rising tell the grace in heaven's plan. Wonderful words. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the Gospel of St. John, the 11th chapter. And since we're approaching the Easter season, it's a wonderful time of rejoicing for God's children because not only did Jesus rise, but it gives us the assurance of our resurrection. Uh, it tells me that there's more than this life. It tells me that God has something for us far on out into eternity. Yes. And uh, so this is a time of rejoicing, a time of assurance. Not only that Jesus went to the cross and died and rose again, but it's the assurance that we're going to rise and be with him forever. So I want us to, this morning, to take a look at the raising of Lazarus from the dead in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. St. John's Gospel, chapter 11, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Can some sickness be to the glory of God? That's, I'm just reading the Bible. That the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Can that be possible? Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. That can't be. Then after that he saith unto his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of hate of late sought to stone thee. Goest thou thither again? And Jesus answered, there are, you not, are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there's no light in him. These things said he, after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Albeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. And then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, by, I want you to get that. Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. <laughs> if you ever called on Jesus, he'd be glad he wasn't there to help you? Come on now, I'm reading the Bible. And I'm glad for your sakes, that I was not there to the intent that ye may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us, go, let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. And then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, here's his wonderful words, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in that place where, Mary, where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she arose hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. And Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. He groaned in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. I think that's one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. There was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a, a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, but some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. It says here that in this third verse, Jesus, when Mary and Martha sent him words, said, He whom thou lovest is sick. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you suppose that when Jesus did, didn't come, do you suppose that they were tempted to believe that Jesus didn't love them? If Jesus doesn't come, sometimes when you call and sometimes he seems to stay away, are you, is there a temptation to think, well, he doesn't love me? He healed others. He raised others from the dead. And he didn't come to me. Now, these stories are in here for a purpose. They want to tell us something. I want you to put yourself in Mary and Martha's place. That, uh, do, you, do you think, now what, what kind of a battle do you think they fought? Well, Jesus could have healed him, and he didn't come. Now, uh, I have a feeling that they, they were greatly tempted to think that Jesus didn't love them. I don't know, but uh, the devil doesn't miss a trick, and I have an idea that, uh, that they fought that battle just like you and I sometimes fight it. But I want you to know they came through victoriously. The point is, will you? Now, I want us to look a little bit about this. As we look at Lazarus, First of all, there's not a whole lot mentioned about him in the Bible. Matthew doesn't mention him. Mark doesn't mention him. Luke doesn't mention him. Uh, he's not a preacher. He's not an apostle. He's not a prophet. 
He had no great calling of anything that we know of. He's just an ordinary man that Jesus liked to stop by and visit with him. If Jesus liked to stop by that ordinary man, he'd like to stop by your house. We often think, well, some people are more important than Jesus to go to them. This was just an ordinary man. And he never did anything great that we know of. While he was not a great person, he was given the privilege to do something great. The privilege to die and go to heaven and be called back. Now, I want you to notice here that uh, God has the power to raise from the dead and the miracles of Jesus uh, are not hit miss. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. That means every step Jesus took was ordered by God and this sickness was planned by God, this death was planned by God and Jesus being there to raise him was planned by God. This was right before his crucifixion. I want you to know he's, he has a purpose because it's showing us something about the crucifixion. So every step of this was ordered by God. If you're living good life, I want you to know your life is just as much ordered by God as theirs is. Your life is no more hit and miss than anything. If you're walking with God, trying to obey God, your life is not hit and miss in any manner whatsoever, but your life is ordered by God. So the miracles of Jesus were not hit and miss. This was happening to good people. And God has a purpose for what he puts you through. God has a purpose for the things that he brings across your pathway, the same as he had a purpose for bringing this across their pathway. You're no different. And God is no different in his attitude toward you. What he has done for one, he'll do for all. This one was for the glory of God, and it was planned by God. If God orders the steps of a good man, I want you to know your life is planned by God too. I think that's marvelous to think that my life and your life has been planned by God. I can't get over that. The great God, of, so many times it looks like we get saved and then God just lets us live until we die and takes us to heaven. Oh, that isn't so. As soon as you give your life and heart to Jesus, try to obey him, every step from then on is ordered by God. Now, there's something else that I want you to notice. God could trust Mary and Martha uh, to do and to go through what they went through for the glory. He could trust them. I want you to know they did not understand what they were going through. And there was probably the great temptation to think that Jesus didn't love them, but I want you to know something, they didn't quit. They didn't say, well, I'll tell you, God doesn't love me anymore. And uh, I'm, I've, we, we fed him, we've kept him in our house. He's been good friends to him and he's healed others. And, and he didn't show up for us. I'm done. I'm, I'm through with him. How many people quit Jesus because they've gone through something they didn't understand and thought Jesus didn't come to help them? And they said, I'm through. They could have said, I'm through. But they stayed with Jesus, and God got glory out of it because they stayed. Oh, I trust, dear ones, that God helps you to get this. They didn't understand what they were going through any more than you understand. And it looks like Jesus had forgotten them and didn't love them, and that's why the devil tells you the same thing. But they stood with it, stayed with it, you stick with it. And what you're going through will bring glory to God. This is the last great miracle that Jesus did before he went to the cross. And Jesus could trust Mary and Martha and Lazarus with this experience. Think of all the heartache and the sorrow they went through. He could trust them to go through this sorrow, this heartache, this difficulty, misunderstanding, not knowing, letting the devil buffet them and saying God doesn't know. He could trust them with this experience to bring glory to God. But even though they didn't understand it, they didn't leave Jesus. Some people just simply could not be trusted with it.
Some would have said Jesus was our friend and we fed him and kept him and supported him. And now when we needed, when we needed him, he didn't show up. And so we're leaving him. Other people said, well, he healed others. Why didn't he heal him? Spirit of analyzation, analyzation can cause us a great deal of difficulty. The world has been blessed because of this miracle. And Jesus is telling us something about resurrection and life. He's telling us this. And I suppose this experience that Mary and Martha went through has blessed more people than probably any other text of Scripture in the Bible. But it's used practically, I suppose, at almost every Christian funeral when anybody dies at all. Well, they run to this verse. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. Why? Because God found three people that he could trust and wouldn't leave him even though it looked like he didn't love them anymore. So by this miracle, he was letting them know that he had power over death. All others raised from all others raised from the dead had been done the same day, but this one, not this one. He had been in the grave for four days. And uh, Lazarus was given the privilege to do this for Jesus. What a privilege. Well, I'll tell you, this miracle stirred up the chief priests and Pharisees, and some people believed, but others, they ran to the Pharisees to tell them what happened. It doesn't make any difference what God would do. Some people wouldn't believe. So they took counsel to put him to death. How much trust did it take Mary and Martha to have, to have, to, to have in Jesus when Jesus made no effort to come when they told him Lazarus was sick? I want to tell you, that took a lot of trust. So I said, the spirit of analyzation is a dangerous thing. Some of them said, could not this man that have opened the eyes of the blind cause this man that he should not have died? I want you to know something. You can't have faith and analyze. The spirit of analyzation will destroy faith. So these that analyzed went to the Pharisees. And they sought out even Lazarus to kill him. The spirit of analyzation wants proof of for everything so they can believe. Wanting proof for everything you believe, dear ones, is a dangerous thing. I was interested on TV the other night as I listened to they were talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And some of you on your Holy Land trips will go by that place to see where it was. And they were talking about it, the marvelous thing, getting it out. And, and the, some of the things were confirming the Word of God. They were rejoicing about that. And they had different scholars there talking about it. And they were saying that they'd found even other books that aren't written in the Bible. And some of them were saying that this may even change Christianity. Nonsense. I don't care what they find. Because I like one scholar, he stood what he said, the right thing. He said, faith doesn't need proof of anything. We don't need proof to find anything in a Dead Sea Scroll. Our proof is our personal relationship with Jesus. What do I have in my heart? It doesn't make any difference what they find. I like what the, what is the old song they used to sing or heard years ago, if there is no God, what is this I feel stirring in my heart? So it doesn't make any difference what they find over there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If they find something that confirms the Word of God, wonderful. But the child of God doesn't need any confirmation of any kind. I like what the dear black lady who said one time and gave such a wise answer when an atheist came to town and said, preached and said, there is no God, and to ask her about it, she gave such a wise answer. She said what he should have said was, there's none that he knows about. That would have been the wise answer for a man to say, I don't know anything about God, but she knew about God. Like Dr. Tozer said, it uh, tells of, I think it was Dr. Tozer, wasn't it, that was told of the 
told of the dear old brother. They were trying to decide whether or not there was a fish big enough to swallow Jonah. And he said, ah, he said, well, this dear old brother said, if they could drain the ocean dry and find nothing bigger than minners, he said, I'd still believe that God created a fish big enough to swallow Jonah. Faith doesn't need to hunt around for a fish big enough to swallow Jonah. Faith isn't dependent on proof. Faith depends upon your relationship with God and what you know about God and your fellowship with God. And then it doesn't make any difference what they find anywhere. As Dr. Tozer said, faith doesn't need proof. Faith that rests on proof isn't faith. It rests on what's found, and that's not faith. Faith believes when there is no proof. Ah, thank God for that. One scholar said when Jesus was told of Lazarus' death, one scholar said he was glad. And when he had to call him back, he wept. What a difference. He knew where Lazarus was. He knew the joy that he was enjoying. But to call him back, he, he wept. He wept. When he had to call him back, he wept. In John, the ninth chapter, Jesus said, I must work, or in this, uh, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man can work. And this he said to his disciples, what is it to me, the day? What is the day when God asks to do something? It's the allotted time that God has to, for you to do a job. That's daylight. It's the time that God says to do it. That's daylight. The day is always long enough for you to do what God says to do. The night is the time of your choosing. You do something for, your, for God on your time. You're working in the night. I trust you get that. It's always night when you choose to do something on your own for God. Thus, a man can never say to God, I'll do it later. It's night later. Later it will be night. And this was the time appointed to Jesus to go to Lazarus, and he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's called, while it's day. When Judas went out, it was night. When a man goes from Christ, it's always night. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus let us know that he is the resurrection and the life, and that the grave he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And I wonder if Jesus didn't allow this to happen to tell something to those who would see it. When Lazarus came forth, he came with the grave clothes around him, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. But when he came out, the grave clothes were left in the grave, and they could see the difference. Lazarus had to be loosed, but Jesus came through the grave clothes. What a difference it was. So no one had to loose Jesus. He came through the grave clothes, and when they came to that uh, grave uh, to find Jesus, they saw the grave clothes right there. He had come through them. And just a little bit before, they had to loose Lazarus and let him go, but not to Jesus. One day, this same Jesus will call all forth from the grave to start an eternal existence for him. What a day! So, this is our temporary dwelling place. We're just passing through. Our real place is going to be in heaven. And someday, the resurrection will simply put us there. But Paul also, or the word of God, Paul tells us that when Jesus comes again, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul said of Jesus coming again, comfort one another with these words. 
words. Tell one another. Encourage one another. Jesus is coming back, and we're all going to go to be with him forever. So we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with him together in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord.